So, hello everybody on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on YouTube. My name is Mark Clements. I'm a broadcaster with the BBC in England, specialising in football. Always looking for those stories behind the headlines, how people got around those roadblocks and challenges to where they are now. And I'm so excited about this particular session, talking to you as I am from London, where it's four o'clock in the afternoon. Meanwhile, in Florida, is Alistair McCaw. And what's, whereabouts are you, Alistair? I'm between Miami and West Palm Beach in a place called Boynton Beach. Ah, don't you have a theory about how people move up that coast in Florida? Yeah, well, they say that you start in Miami when you're young, you move up to Fort Lauderdale, around about your, your 30s, so you get a real job. Then you move up the coast to where I am right now in, in Boynton Beach, and then you eventually retire in West Palm Beach. So you move up just gradually uh, with your age. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and where does that snazzy goalkeeper-style top that you're wearing fit into the equation? Well, I've got to say, I've got to wear my Sunday best if I'm speaking to you, Mark, <laughs> so I, I had to bring it up. But no, it's actually, it's actually one of my favourite golf, uh, golf shirts. I thought that would be appropriate. Yeah, I just wanted to set the scene and make sure everybody knew that you weren't wearing it for a bet or anything like that, Alistair. <laughs> Listen, you have a new book out. Before we get to that point, because it is your fifth, shall we, just for the benefit of any people that are encountering you for the first time, because I'm aware of the fact that people are joining us from various social postings, do you want to give us a little rough, a little pricey, a little sort of summary of how you got to your current position in writing all these glorious books. Oh, gosh, how much time do we have? Well, born in Belfast, Northern Ireland. I'm sure uh, the accent doesn't give that away. <laughs> Brought up in South Africa, um, which I'm very, very grateful for. Fantastic country for lots of sports, especially being brought up in the schools there. I played seven sports. Um, loved tennis from an early age, but became... Uh, a professional in duathlon, which is running and cycling. So that was my first uh, experience of traveling the world. And there's no better way to do it than play, play sports. So um, between the ages of 20 and 30, I, I traveled the world competing. And at the same time, I uh, was studying uh, to become a performance coach. My passion was always fitness and, and sports, etc. So I, I knew I'd go into that industry. Uh, fast forward, um, I would say my evolution of my career is pretty much in my books in terms of starting as a coach, fitness trainer, um, having the opportunity to work with some of the best athletes and coaches in the world. Then uh, I progressed into what I'm doing now in leadership and team culture, which obviously my, my latest book is on that exact subject. And, um, you know, I've just accumulated all those experiences of being an athlete and also having been in world-class environments, training environments uh, around Olympic athletes, et cetera, and just using all that knowledge now to, to educate coaches and leaders. I mean, th that's a lot of very varied stuff. Even I'm thinking climate-wise, there's a big difference between Belfast and the, the sport it's possible to play there as opposed to some of the sunnier climbs that you've been involved with. Has it given you an um, increased appreciation of sport? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, sport opened uh, the window of the world to me, so to say, and this is something I really encourage all parents is to, you know, let your kids play sport, uh, expose them to as, as many sports as possible, let them discover what they love. Um, you know, so often I will have conversations with parents of, of you know, s sports kids and they want that secret sauce. So they want to know how their kid can be professional one day. And it's very simple advice. Let them play. Let them have fun. They, they will be the ones that drive, uh, drive their own passion and desire to be a better athlete or a professional or go to college, for example, one day. But definitely for me, Sports is my life. Sports is my passion. I'm the, I feel I'm the luckiest guy in the world that I get to go into these world-class organizations and teams around the globe and, and, and visit stadiums and places that, you know, I grew up watching on TV. I mean, I suppose anybody tuning in today that, that you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough as well as being a broadcaster with the BBC, I'm an event host and a presentation skills coach. And I always say that if you are putting on any form of presentation you know 
why are we here why you and what's in it for your audience why you alistair why me um that's a that's a good question that's something that hasn't been posed to me before i suppose if i understand your question correctly it's about grabbing opportunities it's about making opportunities you know if you're waiting around for things to happen or you're waiting for your, your phone to ring for example it's not going to happen i think uh, you know nobody gets to a certain level or nobody reaches a, a you know a high high level without putting in hard work putting in the extra hard work that is and that's something that i really uh, encourage young people to do as well as you know don't just do enough do more than what's been asked of you and you'll be successful and uh, i think that's something that's relevant in 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 business, in sports, the ones who succeed, the one who get to the top are the ones that do that little bit extra without having to be asked. It's what I call the 5%. Why the 5% succeed is because they're willing to do more than what's been asked of them. But I don't know. That's a good question, Mark. Why me? Um, I'm, I just feel I'm very, I'm very blessed. I'm very grateful to be where I am today. And, and, you know, a massive part of my purpose is, is helping others achieve their best as well, no matter what that may be. Yeah. And I guess I first encountered you on a couple of levels, but maybe some quite high profile broadcaster friends of mine were following you on socials and that made me intrigued. And then I started to, you know, see some of your books, read some of your books. And I, I kind of love the simplicity of them because we're all busy. I mean, I don't know about you and what's just out of shot all around you. I don't ask. But over here, I've got a pile of maybe eight, nine inches of the beautiful history. Somebody sent me a book about the English game. I know John Barnes' book about race is in there. I've got, you know, it's an overloaded market, isn't it? And I think the biggest compliment I can pay to you is the, the simplicity, the bite-sized nature of the way in which you write. Do you take that as the compliment that it's intended to be? Yeah, you know, these days we have so much information, we have so much knowledge at our hands, we're all busy. So I wanted to to write a book that was easy to digest. You know, you talk about bite-sized information. Um, it's actually a structure of my last four books is bite-sized. Um, chapters are no more than three pages, for example, but it's that you can get a, a, a message. It's something that you can self-reflect on as yourself. And, you know, if, sometimes if we just get too much information, I mean, if I read, for example, a book, maybe it's just me, but I read 30 pages, 40 pages, I've probably forgotten what the first 20 pages were, for example. So my, my goal in this book was really to bring a message across. It's a, it's a book you can have on your desk at work or wherever where you can come in, come in in the morning, read five minutes, read something on one of the 44 lessons, for example, and get, get something from it. Lead with purpose, make an impact. What, what, what was the specific inspiration for this one, Alistair? Well, I believe we all need a purpose. And, and you know, purpose is the greatest, greatest motivator. But, but for me, my purpose is to serve others. It's to get the best out, out of other people. And I just thought this would be a, a fantastic title uh, to the book. Um, a massive part of my purpose is to make an impact on, on the lives of others. Um, you know, growing up in South Africa, we had the Proteus uh, cricket team there, and I was very fortunate to work with the captain, Graham Smith. And this is way back in the early 2000s. Graham was still a young 18-year-old eight, uh, cricket player, but I always knew that, that he had great leadership qualities. But they had something there called Ubuntu, which is, is from Africa, and it's about we can't grow without others. And it's so important that we help each other grow on a day-to-day -day basis. And this is something that the best teams have, the best cultures have, is that they're supporting and encouraging each other. So that was uh, the purpose of the book. And, of course, leadership is just a, a massive passion of mine. Um, from a very young age, I was always intrigued about leadership, why, why teachers, coaches, team captains were successful and why some weren't, for example. So I didn't know it back then as, as a young nipper, as a teenager, but uh, leadership was always something I was very, very curious about. When we're setting purpose, Alistair, how important is it that we get complete buy-in, that it can't just be one individual's purpose, that this is a shared, unified goal, that anybody who's invested in it is exactly that? 
You know, it's been a buzzword, Mark, for for the past few years, you know, find your purpose. And a lot of people have, uh, a lot of people don't know what their purpose is. And always say, you know, what are you passionate about? What's something you love doing in your spare time? And and you can find your purpose. But um, it's always been, you know, your purpose can fleet as well. It can change. You know, my purpose five years ago or 10 years ago isn't what my purpose is today, for example. You know, I'm more into... Uh, uh, leadership, serving others, making an impact on the lives of others and helping others find their purpose as well. But, you know, uh, the most successful people, the happiest people, which I, for me, happiness is is, is success, are, are the ones that, that wake up with purpose, r- regardless what that is. It can be, it can be different for everybody. Have you got a, have you got a particular technique, a sort of evaluation exercise that helps people if gut feel alone is not enough to set purpose? I, you know, it's getting out there and, and trying as many different things as possible and being more open-minded. And that's been a big word for me in the last year or two, especially with COVID. Um, and, and I like to call this book my COVID baby because it was written during COVID. And that was my purpose during COVID was to to bring this book out and, 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 and help others. But, you know, find what you, what you love to do, what lights a fire in, in, inside of you. Um, again, it, it could be anything. It could be the arts. It could be sports. It could be volunteering. It could be public speaking. It could be what you're doing, Doing, for example. I mean, it's something that you just love to do, and, and that helps you find that purpose. I mean, um, these days we have so many uh, different movements as well, you know, Black Lives Matter and Me Too and all these things. And, and those are those are for, for people. Those are a purpose as well, a massive purpose in their lives. They've found what they want to do. Yeah. Have you ever been lost? There might be people who are watching us this afternoon, wherever they are in the world, whatever time it is, who might have had a tough time over the past 18 months, might be looking for some salvation, guidance, direction. Have you ever had any moments where you really didn't know where you were heading and if so the purpose of this question how did you steer yourself out of that place you know mark to answer that question multiple times i've i've been lost um i've questioned myself i've doubted myself so you know anybody sometimes alistair what's that mark sorry still do you still you said multiple times yes absolutely you know it's it's uh, i i'm not afraid to say that as well and that especially in the last Two years during COVID, I had some really dark moments, just maybe like everybody else out there as well, where I did feel a little bit lost. I questioned questioned my purpose, obviously had more time to, to think about it. Um, in the past, I have suffered from, from depression, and I felt those those states coming on a little bit, bit as well during COVID. And um, I think part of my purpose that got me through that period was looking outwards and and trying to help as many other people as possible during that time you know with ed bowers we held we we held a few uh, live seminars and discussions as well and and you know for me that was a massive purpose was not just thinking about myself um you know it was in fact some of the best advice i ever got was from my mother when i was uh, suffering from depression in the early 2000s and it was you know have purpose to your day wake up brush your hair put on some nice clothes maybe a shirt like this, Mark, and, and go and do something for others. Yeah. And, you know, that was that was the process for me for getting for getting better was wake up as simple as that. You know, when you don't feel good, you don't dress well, your hair, whatever, was take pride in appearance, number one, and go and do something for somebody else today. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, helping a, an old lady across the street with her grocery bags or whatever it may be. And that was part of the process of me uh, um, re- getting better. Yeah, I, I, I'm really sorry to you know hear about the tough times that you've been through. I guess the reason for me asking is that you know there's a tendency, I think, particularly those who are struggling or maybe at the start of a career, to think that those that have are a bit further down the line just have these seamless, beautiful lives where everything's perfect. And of course, it's not. You have days that you're not very happy about and I do exactly the same and who, and who knows I might just be putting on a front now I might have just been like the little duck feet below the water all day to get to this moment where four o'clock UK time I can sit down for a 
blissful, peaceful 45 minutes with you. So it's an important point that I just wanted to make for the benefit of anybody that is feeling a little bit lost now that it's a destination we all visit from time to time. Yeah, and, and as, yeah absolutely, Mark. Um, and as, as we know, we're not out of this yet. Um, uh, I actually had to cancel my trip to the UK, unfortunately, because of the latest lockdowns, etc. So, you know, we are still going through this. And, you know, just to add to, to the previous um, uh, question that you asked, I think having the uh, good people around you is is massively important, reaching out to others. And, and I just, you know, right now we're not out of it. So keep reaching out, keep checking in with others, make that phone call, send that message. And, and you know, it's so, so important right now. Yeah. Now, the other part of the book's title, the new book's title is Make an Impact. Now, we can all make an impact. Doesn't mean it's the right sort of impact though alistair so what do we mean when we're talking about making an impact well regardless who you are um you know you don't need to be rich you don't need to be famous to to make an impact you know it's about reaching out and helping helping one person so you know the, the 44 lessons in this book are on leadership and the thing is mark we're all leaders because the first person you have to lead is yourself and as a parent you're a leader as a, a teacher you're a leader um, a coach, a manager, whatever it may be, you are a leader. And, and again, the most important, the, the best investment you can make is in yourself and investing in your, your leadership skills in order to make an impact on, on somebody else. And to make an impact, you have to have an influence on, on another person or, or, or people as well. So you now how do you build an influence through connections, relationships, building trust, which which gains the influence so you know anyone can make an impact i think that's an important message uh to the listeners right now hmm. but we're looking for positive impact obviously that was one of the points that i was making we can make an impact we can be having a particularly bad day so i think are we talking a big part of making an impact is that great leaders set the tone absolutely leaders go leaders go first um, and it's something on one of my visits actually to Glasgow Rangers, the football club in Scotland, was uh, I got to spend um, a day with with Stephen Gerrard and, and Michael Beale and Jordan Milsom and, and the guys up there. And watching for I know there'll be a lot of, of football people watching this as well, but just watching the leadership skills of, of Stephen Gerrard and how he's made an impact, not only on the club, of course, now he's moved to Aston Villa as well, but on on the people. And his ability to move around the room, his ability to adapt his his, his leadership st uh, styles to the different people there as well, um, that was that was massively impressive. So, um, yeah, there's so many examples. Can we drill down into this a little bit? I mean, give us an example. You're there, you're observing, you're kind of um, watching. Just paint us a, an even deeper picture, if you would, of that particularly app person who obviously has had a very good start since his switch of clubs what you know what where did he go what did he do what kind of people did he talk to yeah look we all have different leadership styles and Stephen is, is a much quieter leader he's not someone that's very very vocal or says very much for which for me can actually be very very impactful of a leader that's not saying too much because when he speaks you listen or when when she speaks you listen but i, I think what struck me was the influence he's had, he had at, at Glasgow Rangers. And you can always tell the culture very, very early on when you go into an organization. And that already started at the front gate with the security man. Um, pleasant, cracked a joke or two, had a chat. It already made me feel at ease walking in there. Went into the, the reception of the uh, Mulgarvney uh, training ground in, in um, just outside Glasgow. Uh, had a nice chat with the receptionist and already you just you could just feel a, a great culture people say hello in the hallways um, Morales who's their top striker there walked past smiled said hello and I was like okay this is you know even their best player who doesn't know me um, greets me first which was a massive massive impression on me he didn't have to do that um, atmosphere of it looks like people want to be there they're having fun there's laughter and that's another thing I've, I've discovered mark in successful cultures is that people are having fun while they're working hard 
Um, what else? Just like I said, you know, he joined joined us very, very busy. He joined us for lunch as well, um, asked a lot of questions. And this is something I've discovered in great leaders as well. I got to spend time with Coach K. Mike Krzyzewski here at, at Duke University where I, I consult at. And they ask you a lot of questions. Now, I wanted to ask them a lot of questions. I wanted to ask Stephen a lot of questions, but he was asking me questions. And that was something that just really struck me is that great leaders are curious. And, and um, again, just the atmosphere in that building, I, I could just see that he was going to be successful. This was, this was I think, three years ago, um, maybe the, the first or second year he was at, at the club. And you can already see the difference he's making it at Aston Villa as well. Yeah. I asked you to paint a picture and you did it beautifully. Just that idea that there is, there is buy-in to take us back to one of my early questions that the atmosphere permeates out of the leader. If the leader walks in the place and turns their back on a junior member of staff because they've had a bad day, got cut up on the road, you know, not had enough sleep, it, it can have an impact. Just turning up and putting a smile on your face and lifting the place is a big part of a leader's role, is it not, Alistair? Absolutely. I mean, you're responsible for the energy you bring into, into a room, and leaders set that tone. You know, leaders for me are like a, a thermostat. They, they, they're the ones that, that, uh, that set the temperature. But one more thing about Stephen that really impressed me. I mean, honestly, he still looks enough. He looks still fit enough to play. But um, when I was leaving the building at around 7 p.m. That, that evening, there was one guy that was in the gym working out, and it was Steven Gerrard. So, you know, we talk about the first to arrive, the last to leave, setting the example. Well, there, there was Steven Gerrard at 7 p.m. It was a cold Tuesday evening, I think it was, in the gym himself working out. So, you know, when you see that, uh, already you have, you have the, the example in front of you. Yeah. I, I, I'm thinking of a couple of examples as well just to enhance – the, the curiosity element that you talked about where Stephen wanted to ask you some questions. And I can think of one current Premier League manager who wanted to play in a new way. So he took his entire backroom staff to see a quite, if you like, lower league manager who specialised in that style of play and took took them all along for three, four hours and then sort of went away and his entourage all stayed together and they were phoning this other guy for more information into the evening. So not too humble, even though they might be on a much higher plane right now, not too humble to ask for opinion. And actually, I can think of one major, major UK footballer who probably aspires to move into management. Again, somebody gave me an example quite recently of receiving a phone call from him to say, if I do this and get into this scenario, how would I deal with it? Is, that, is there a, an element of being humble in there as well that marks out the true great leaders, Alistair? Absolutely, without a doubt. You know, th that experience also with Coach K at, at, at Duke University. Now, Coach K has been there for 42 seasons. Um, he's one of the, if not the most successful uh, men's basketball coach. I know that... Um, Pat Summit is, is, I think, overall the most successful basketball coach with, with wins, et cetera. But just their curiosity um, and, and the questions they ask and, uh, yeah, just open-mindedness as well. I think that's something, you know, Coach K is 72. He's still there coaching. Also a man in incredible shape. We talk about energy as well, bringing a great energy into the building. But um, evolving, adapting. You know, that's 42 years of coaching that you're still relevant, that you're still successful. You know, for me, uh, you know, it's I'm not saying it's easy to be successful for one or two seasons, but sustained success of all those years. We, you know, we think of Sir Alex Ferguson, sustained success. It didn't. We have to remember that didn't start off too well for Sir Alex Ferguson at, at, at Manchester United. They wanted him sacked. Uh, within two years so it just shows you that nothing has changed in terms of of wanting quick results but yeah that's that's what struck me about these um these great leaders is they're very curious yeah and if you are interested in the subject of curiosity for example chapter nine of alistair's book is lead with curiosity and chapter 34 is lead with humility 
my eyes were drawn to chapter two, lead with integrity. Do you think there are many long-standing leaders in the world who don't lead with integrity? Is it hard to be that kind of repeat person of regular success if you are not somebody who imparts integrity? Yeah, I think that's that's one of the, the, the toughest ones, to be honest. And we've seen many a great leader fall. But um, I think I was asked this question, and I, I wrote it in the book as well, is right now, can you list three leaders that are doing a great job? Can you? That's the question. Right now? Yeah, go on. on. Go on. Let me oh, so you're, okay. you're, you're firing that one back at me. Yeah, come on. Get, can you think of three leaders that are doing well, it would, it would obviously be, be very easy for me to, to name three sports leaders because that would be that would be cheating. But right now, and, and there's going to be some that disagree out there. I'm not big into politics, etc. But I think Jacinda Ahern of, of New Zealand, the, the premier of New Zealand, is, is doing a good job. I mean, right now it's, it's incredibly challenging times. Um, you know, uh, a crisis doesn't a crisis reveals your leadership qualities. It doesn't make them; it reveals them. Um, Jacinda Ahern, I'd say, would be one. Well, this is this is a great question. I'm going to cheat and 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 go sports. Toto Wolf of Mercedes Benz has achieved sustained sustained uh, sustained excuse me success over uh, seven years with the the Formula One team there with Lewis Hamilton. I'd say he's doing a great job. And one more, gosh, um, you see, I can't even answer that own question because yeah. there's so many elements to that of who's doing a, a great job in leadership. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, thanks, I, thanks, thanks for that, Mark. That was a good a good turn there. That was a boomerang one. <laughs> yeah. If you are just joining us on Twitter, on YouTube, on LinkedIn, Alistair's got probably about another sixteen maybe 18 minutes to think of his third great leader. You can have that swirling around in your head. I was drawn to chapter 41, lead with energy. Yes, but don't you have to manage those energy levels as well? And again, that takes sacrifice of making sure you have the right nutrition, the right levels of recreation to take your mind away from the cold face to use a dated expression uh, and, and sleep levels as well. It can take a lot out of you if you lead an organization with energy. Absolutely. You know, you can't give energy if you don't have energy and that's, that's where it all starts. So, you know, I'll be the first one to put my hand up and, and say that I've crashed and burned a few times in, in my career of just, you know, doing too much overworking. Maybe it's the overthinking as well that that was part of it as well. But you know, talk about self-leadership, which is also a chapter in, in the book as well, is that the most important person you need to lead is yourself. And that starts with your health. That starts with your wellness. And it's, it's a conversation I usually have first with the coaches or leaders that I mentor as well is, is one of the first questions I ask is, how are you? Not how is your business? How is your team, et cetera, but how are you? Because you cannot lead an organization. You cannot lead people if you're not um, uh, taking good care of yourself. You don't have a good energy uh, about you. I mean, energy affects everything. It affects our relationships. It, affe it affects our work output. Um, so, you know, I put that at, at, at the top of the list. And for me, that's about trying to get uh, enough sleep e each night. I'm not a great sleeper. So, you know, I've tried many things to, to sleep better, darker room, the temperature, etc. cetera, um, getting a good breakfast, taking some time out during the day, just to mentally uh, disengage. And something I like to do is take a 20 minute nap in the afternoon uh, after lunch. Now I don't, I don't sleep, but it's just going into a quiet room or a quiet place. Sometimes even when if, if I'm on the road, I'll go to the car and no phone, no nothing, just mentally just switch off for 20 minutes. And I can tell you what a difference that has made in the rest of my day as well. But you know, again, we are responsible for the energy we bring. And in great environments, great cultures, there is a great energy. And that starts with the leader himself. Yeah. And sometimes having to act as if, because not everybody is going to have 
a great day every day. There are going to be times when our energy levels are dissipated, Alistair, when we simply don't feel like it and have to show up because we've made a commitment to show up, where maybe we've got distractions from our personal life, other professional commitments that we feel we should be dealing with, but we have to deal with our current situation. So there are going to be act as if moments too, Alistair? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we can't always be at our best. And this is something I, I think that's so important to, to uh, understand is that, you know, not every day is going to be game day. Not every day is going to be the Super Bowl day, for example. So, you know, we need to understand that we need to learn how to manage ourselves. I think I think two of the most important things to invest today and besides your health are uh, generations and emotional intelligence. And that first one, the personal competence, the ability to know yourself, knowing when you need a break, knowing when you need to step out of that room, knowing when you need to maybe not be engaged in that conversation, for example. So, you know, all these things are are, are massive factors. Yeah. Although um, a, a, a long-standing, very senior football manager pal of mine, so I use this phrase, we can't all be at our best all the time. And he said, well, wait a minute, if I hire a bricklayer to come around and redo my kitchen wall, it, it's not acceptable to me that every 20th brick is slightly poking out and out of sync and pattern with everything else. So I'll, I'll throw that one back at you. Exactly. I suppose it's just like a surgeon or a, or a dentist. You can't have a bad day, can you? I mean, yeah. there's, there's obviously lives at stake and and so on and so forth. But, you know, I think this is something also in my own life as well, Mark, was uh, being very hard on myself, being very tough on myself. And it's something I've learned over the years as well as to to cut myself some slack. And I'm sure there's some people out there that can, can resonate with that of, you know, not beating yourself up about not getting the perfect result or having the the, the, the perfect outcome, for example. And I've learned to to get better with that because I would I would beat myself up about things if it wasn't done perfectly or or, or, or well enough, for example. So um yeah. Doesn't that come with track record though? Doesn't that come with some success always in the bag that it it becomes a little bit easier to be a little bit kinder to yourself if you know you've already achieved in your past let's say we've got people tuning in who are at fledgling stages of their career it is going to be nose against the the pane of glass all the time and pushing and pushing and pushing until they feel a sense of success around them and and that's the thing is you know if i look at my own life is okay one book is great no i need two books now you know i've i've finished five books i'm already on to six for example so it's continually chasing that but that's something that that fuels me as well but I think it all comes down to people's uh, personal standards mark you know in terms of being being tough on yourself being uh, wanting to do better all the time and you know I think maybe it's with age and maybe I'm a little bit late coming to to the party of of just you know relaxing a little bit more on that side of course I want to do my best of course I want to put out the best book possible we are I'm my own biggest critic as, as well. But yeah, I think it's just learning how to be better to yourself, treat yourself yeah. better and not beat yourself up about things all the time. Yeah. So I think there is a point with maturity of professional life. And I keep using the phrase laissez-faire and it's not properly appropriate in so much as I don't mean you don't care, but I think you do reach a point where you go, I tried my very best with the resources that I had, I made the decisions that needed to be made made at the time they needed making. And if it if it's not good enough, then I know I gave it my all. And I, I don't want that to be a let yourself off the hook. But I, I think the longer you go through life, the more that does start to rise up in your consciousness. I don't know whether you're a bit younger than me, but I don't know whether that has any resonance with where you are in your life. I, th I think it does. And, you know, one of the first questions I always like to ask people is how do you define success? And relating to this, this topic that we're talking about is for six, a part of success for me, Mark, is putting my head on the pillow at night and knowing I, I did my best. I, I did everything I could that day under the circumstances. And I have to be okay with that. Um, you know, it's, it, I think for me, that's a part of success is, is knowing I did my best. I think it was actually a John Wooden quote 
uh, of knowing that you've done your best is success. We got to this point, and I guess uh, the question I've got to ask is the difference between a leader and a great leader, the difference between managing and leading. Yeah, you manage you manage uh, an organization, you manage a, a company, but you lead people. There's a difference difference there. And, you know, we can go into so many qualities and traits of a great leader. You know, we list there 44 lessons in, in leadership in, in my book, In Effective Coaching and Leadership. But um, I, I think it's so important to understand is that you don't manage people, you lead people, you manage businesses, you manage teams, you manage organizations. And there is a, a difference between those two things. You know, management is about systems. It's about strategies. As we're leading people is about inspiring them, uh, creating the vision, uh, getting the best out of them, uh, reaching goals, reaching o o objectives, etc. So, yeah, there's there's a difference. I, uh, who is this book aimed at primarily? I mean, it'd be very easy to say, oh, there's something in there for everybody. And obviously there is because we're all still learning. But do you have a kind of archetypal image of the, the person that you feel you'd like to buy this book? Well, of course, all coaches, all leaders, teachers. I mean, this is this is a book that I've interviewed some of the the world's best leaders, coaches, even people in the education sector. Uh, Pete Goodyear, as well, who's who's a headmaster in in uh, in the south of England, very successful. So, uh, there's so many different sectors. But if you're in coaching, if you're in leadership, if you have a company, an organization, you lead people. Uh, then definitely this would be a, a worthwhile book because the lessons in this book are relatable to 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 almost ev every area, regardless, every sector. You know, there's no difference between uh, leading and managing a sports team as there is to leading and managing a company, for example. Again, it's about creating the vision, getting your best out of your people and reaching goals. What was your wow moment in all the in interviews that you conducted for this what was what was the moment when alistair mccaw learned something new oh there, there's so many lessons and this is something i i'm Please share. You know, <laughs> uh, there's so many that that I'm, I'm i'm grateful for that i get to speak to these people and they come off uh a lot of the interviews come off from my my um podcast champion minded but one of those I'd say was from Phil Neville, the Manchester, the former Manchester United player who's now down here in, in Inter, Inter Miami, and sharing his experiences with with the great uh, Sir Alex Ferguson. It was on having the tough conversations, having the hard conversations. Nobody likes them, but they needed to be had. And he he said that Sir Alex was a master at having the hard conversations, and in fact you would leave his office feeling pretty good about yourself, even if you were dropped from the team that week. Because Sir Alex had this way of making you feel special, making you feel an important part of the project. You know, he'd say to the player, listen, I'm resting you this week because we want you at your best on, on, on the weekend. And he just had this way. So that really was, that really struck me of, of, you know, we don't like having hard conversations, but he was a master at it. Brendan Rogers, the Leicester City uh, uh, manager as well said the better relationships you have with people the easier it is to have the hard conversations and that's another one that that really stood out for me hmm. and it's a hallmark of a great leader isn't it you know I, I when I'm coaching communication and presentation skills I always say great leaders fastidious grasp of the basics hello goodbye please and thank you as we've always said the ability to change tone depending on who you're dealing with but the key ability of being able to dispense challenging information and tell people things that they don't want to know. It's an absolute master skill, Alistair. Absolutely. And I mean, great leaders, great coaches, you know, when you observe them, when you're around them, they know, they know their people, they know their, they, they know their families, they know their names. It's all those, if you want to call them small things, which aren't, um, that, that really sets them apart. They're really interested in other people. And that's the thing, instead of trying to be interesting, rather be interested, be interested in others. You know, great coaches and leaders show they care, which is massively as well, because people don't care how much you know until the, how much uh, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. That's a big one. 
It, it's an unusual question as we start to wrap up our inspiring chat together, but without naming names, have you ever been disappointed by a leader, somebody that you have gone to chat to with certain perceptions only to find that behind the scenes, it didn't quite add up? Yes, I have. And, and I actually think I, I um, mentioned it in the book as well. Again, not, not uh, uh, throwing out any names there as well, but I think we've all had poor leadership and, and I think we've, you know, be it through school or a sports team or a company or volunteering, whatever it may be. I think we've all experienced poor leadership, uh, poor leadership. And that's why it's important. Uh, the advice I give to young people is go out and get as many experiences as possible. You know, especially in your, your teenage years, if you're able to, to work a job. And that's something I'm very grateful for as well as I worked many jobs as a teenager. So already I was exposed to culture and leadership. And uh, yeah, but uh, definitely there's been been more than one case, Mark. Yeah. The book is out when, Alistair, please? Is it out now? It is already out. It was released on the 25th of November worldwide. Okay. So that means we, you can probably pick it up from your usual outlets, from some of the bigger online retailers. I'm thinking probably, uh, and, and this goes the same. Amazon, you. Yes. If Amazon, if you are interested in Alistair's other works, Seven Keys to Being a Great Coach, Becoming a Great Team Player, Champion Minded, Developing a Winning Attitude and Mindset, go to Amazon. And there it is, Lead with Purpose, Make an Impact. Dead simple. All you got to do is press a button and it'll be landing on your doormat or in next door's planter outside their front door within the next couple of days. If I had to get you to choose your top three own takeaways from your own new book, Alistair, what would they be? What would be the top three things that you would pick out, please? Um, I would definitely say one of those chapters would be lead with authenticity. Uh, I think authentic leaders, be your best self is important. Don't try to be another version of somebody else be the best version of yourself and i think that's a lesson for life as well as is you don't try to be like somebody else be the best version of yourself nobody can do it better than you can and you know a great example of that which i write about as well as jürgen klopp at the beginning they wondered if he was authentic if he was always just this energetic man who hugged everybody and you know here we are many years later he still is that that person he's the same person he is at home than he than you see on the field at, at anfield on the weekend for example so Authenticity would be one. Um, I think another big one for me is open-mindedness, as we, we, we discussed as well, uh, being more open-minded, being more curious, uh, not being too judgmental, uh, something that you know we all struggle with sometimes is being judgmental, and that blocks our ability to, to be more open-minded. Um, Can I just stop there? Is that is that an Amazon delivery of your own coming in I the background? I think it actually might be. It actually might be my own book, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's an exciting moment, but I'm not done with you yet. I need one more. And don't forget, after Jacinda Ahern, Toto Wolf, you owe me one ball leader as well. Yeah, um, I would say uh, standards, L leading leading with standards. In fact, it was the very first page of, of my very first book I wrote was Set Your Standards. Uh, what's acceptable, what's not acceptable. So, yeah, definitely those those three would stand out for me. And can you give me one more leader? Do I need to help you? Oh, one more leader. Are we? Are we back? We're back to that yeah, question. No, I think we. You know, I'm a completer finisher, Alistair. I tell you, who's doing a fantastic job, and he contributed to the book is Phil Jones, the CEO of Brother UK, which is a massive technology firm, of of course. But um, you know, I've had I've had one or two dinners with Phil, and again, talk about a leader who asks you a lot of questions, who's curious, who's always learning, um, very, very humble as well. Uh, again, sustained success, uh, uh, you know, just a, fan a fantastic guy. So definitely that's a leader that stands out for me is, is Phil Jones. And I was super, super fortunate to have him contribute to the book as well. Yeah, it's been absolutely splendid. We got there in the end with your own choice of leaders. I mean, they were great. Lead with authenticity, lead with open-mindedness, lead with standards. I mean, I'd scribbled loads down, but I just highlighted there as you were talking, you know, just, just the clarity of some of your wider 
values and beliefs. What's your purpose? You talked about le leaders, you manage an organization, you lead people. And I loved as well, you said leaders set the thermostat, which I think is just, it's just a, a, a great way of thinking about it. You, we're all constantly leaving our imprint on the world. Why not make it the best version of ourselves it can be? I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add before we finish, Alistair. Um, just a massive thanks to everybody who's helped uh, helped with the book. Uh, Denise McKay, my co-writer, Eli Blyden, um, all the contributors, Ed Bowers, everybody out there, just massive, massively grateful because this is not an individual, individual job. It's a team effort. So I just want to say a big thanks to everybody out there. It's been an absolute joy. I, when we first sort of logged on together, I did wonder if I'd managed the full 45 minutes staring at that shirt, but I got through it, Alistair. I'm going to be sending you one over uh, over soon, Mark. <laughs> I'm sorry that we won't get to see each other. I know we did have a commitment to see each other next week. I'm sorry that the, the latest lockdowns are going to prevent us from doing that. I do look forward to seeing you in person when it's safe to do so. It's been an absolute joy, Alistair. Thanks to you guys for joining us. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you and yours remain safe. It already remains for me to say I'm Mark Clement. And thanks for joining us for the discussion about Lead with Purpose, Make an Impact, the new book from Alistair McCaw. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>